Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to our webinar entitled Estrogen Metabolism, Are We Assessing It Properly? And our guest speaker today is Dr. Filomena Trindade. My name is Michael Chapman and I'm a medical education specialist at Genova's Asheville branch and I'm gonna serve as moderator for today's webinar. We would like to welcome Dr. Filomena Trindade. Dr. Trindade is an internationally sought after speaker She's both a graduate of and faculty for the Marsani College of Medicine at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida, where she is involved in the Anti-Aging, Regenerative, and Functional Medicine Fellowship. And Dr. Chandati is also an educator for the Institute for Functional Medicine. After obtaining her BA in biology, she went on to finish a master's in public health in the area of environmental health and epidemiology before starting medical school. She graduated first in her class in family practice from the University of California Davis School of Medicine and did her residency training in family practice at the UC San Francisco Santa Rosa program. She has also been in clinic practice for over 16 years. Before starting her own private practice in functional medicine in 2004, she was the medical director of a nonprofit organization that catered to the underserved. And she is currently very active in developing teaching programs in functional medicine in the US, Latin America, and Europe. One of the most common questions asked during the webinars is the, about the availability of this presentation in the slide deck. These materials will be available on our website within a week of the webinar. If you're interested in having these resources, please click the clinicians tab on the home page where you'll find access to our webinars under medical education. Or you can also log into your MyGDX account to find these webinars. And if you don't have a MyGDX account, please click on the getting started link on our home page. And now I'm going to turn over the controls to uh, you, Dr. Trindade. Thanks, Michael. And I can see your screen great. All right, everyone. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what part of the world um, you're at. And let's move on to estrogen metabolism. Are we assessing it properly? because I really feel that we could be doing a lot more to help our patients by looking at estrogen metabolism than what we may be currently doing. And in particular, I really want to talk to you about estrogen metabolism with respect to cancer risk and really look at breast cancer, prostate cancer, all hormone-related cancers really, but in particular breast in women, prostate in men, because it's also really important to look at estrogen metabolism in men and be able to hopefully have a treatment plan that you can use for someone with an unfavorable estrogen profile. We'll go through a couple cases at the end and really focus on how important methylation is and that methylation step in estrogen metabolism and how we can apply that to our patients to really help prevent disease, and in this case, especially cancer. Uh, I feel like this is one area where we can make a big change in our patient's risk status. So let's just start by reviewing a little bit of the literature. Just take a nice deep breath and imagine a place that you love being at. And I want to start out by really focusing on the fact that we have studies showing that exposure to genotoxic environmental chemicals is a risk factor for breast cancer. And this is not new material. For example, this study was from 1987, and we've had studies since then continuing sort of this crusade. This is a study from this year, just earlier this year, again, showing that there's published evidence to establish a causal relationship between estrogen in the environment and breast cancer. Now, all you and I know how difficult it is to show causation in medicine, right? And they're actually talking here about a causal relationship between estrogens in the environment, things like cadmium, bisphenol A, phthalates, mercury, by the way, you know, if you're using any perfume, whenever you hear the word parfum in the label, that is a, that's a phthalate because sometimes it may not say phthalate, but it'll say parfum and that is a phthalate just to, to know because um, I think we all do things that we know are not the best for our health, but I think the important thing is to pick one or two that you know may not be the best for you, but it's something you really enjoy. You know, I have a friend who always talks about this in relation to her nail polish. She says that's the one thing she won't give up. Well, with me, it's perfume. And, you know, there are some more um, 
sort of healthy, if you will, uh, perfumes out there, but many times the ones we like may not be. So as long as you choose wisely, um, I think that's really what it, it's important. Now, there's a, another study uh, showing the role of estradiol metabolism. So estrogen metabolism as one of the components in the development of experimental breast cancer. So what we're talking about now is, yes, there is associations between the way we metabolize our hormones and breast cancer. Extremely, extremely important because this means that we can increase the risk in our patients, um, and this is not new. This is an article from 2015, but we have articles dating uh, back to 2001 talking about the same thing. Now, remember that it's really when we're talking about estrogen metabolism, it's the 4-hydroxy -hydro pathway that is the most malign and the one that can increase the risk of breast cancer. And we'll go through that in just a little bit more. But this is an earlier article. So I just showed you one from 2017. This is an earlier article from 2001 showing that it's extremely important that we look at exposure to the 4-hydroxyestrone because that's the one that can lead to the formation of DNA addicts. And that that itself, that process, is the initiating event for a tumor. And that we can then use estrogen metabolites to, as a biomarker to detect susceptibility to estrogen-induced cancer. Now, this is from 2001. And to me, the sad part is that this is not being put into clinical practice, right? We are not being aggressive and um, discussing this in, in not just amongst ourselves in sort of the functional medicine, integrative medicine field, but in traditional medicine where I feel like it needs to be applied because this is extremely important. Because imagine how much we could do to decrease someone's risk if we were looking at estrogen metabolism and treating it appropriately and increasing the uh, sort of the 2-hydroxy pathway, for example, and the methylation, as well as the glutathione conjugation, which we'll get to a little bit later. Because what we don't want to do is form these DNA um, addicts that can then be tumor-initiating events. So having said that, let's take a closer look at estrogen metabolism and realize that estrogen is part of the steroidogenic pathway. It just comes a little bit later in, um, in the pathway itself. And so we're talking about specifically the metabolism of estrogen. So just like to have a pitch for the bigger picture so we can see the forest and not just the trees, because we know that when it comes to estrogen metabolism, we're predominantly talking about two phases, phase one and phase two. And although this happens in the liver predominantly, it also happens in other tissues. And remember that we can have single nucleotide polymorphisms in both phase one and phase two. And that really what we're talking about in, path, in phase one it's, although it's been considered um, a major pathway, we're really talking about a hydroxylation reaction. So that in the process of metabolizing a hormone, hormone or unused estrogen in this case, for example, that we're actually creating a more toxic metabolite or intermediate that can then um, needs to be further metabolized, further changed by phase two. And so phase one, predominantly hydroxylation reaction, phase two, a conjugation reaction, whether we're talking about glucuronidation, sulfation, methylation, or glutathione. Now, with respect to estrogen metabolism, the methylation and glutathione conjugation is extremely important, although glucuronidation and sulfation is as well, but it's particularly when we're talking about estrogen metabolism and the risk of hormone-related cancer, be it breast, prostate, or other, we're really focusing on the methylation and the glutathione conjugation. Now let's just review a little bit with phase one first, and then we'll go on to phase two. So in phase one, there were three main paths, if you will, that um, we can take. So phase one, think of CYP1A1, or the two pathway, CYP3A4, or the 16 hydroxy pathway, or CYP1B1, or the four hydroxy pathway. Now I often, um, sort of talk about these or have broken them down as the good, the bad, and the ugly. So by that, I mean, if you're predominantly using the 2-hydroxy pathway, with a few exceptions, that's the good. So that is the least malign of the pathways. 16-hydroxy, bad, not great. 
but not as bad as a 4-hydroxy pathway or this 4-hydroxy sort of being the ugly or what I call it the, the worst. And remember that when you have a single nucleotide polymorphism in any of those pathways, you have an up regulation with that, of that pathway. And with in CYP1A1, for example, let's just start there, an upregulation of that pathway means you have more of the 2-hydroxyestrone, which can then be methylated and is protective. But there are a few exceptions because, as I said, we have a, when you have a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism in phase one, you have an upregulation of that pathway. And so in theory, you think, oh, it's a 2, it's the good, it should be uh, a desirable thing. There are a few exceptions, particularly in patients who have a SNP there, but also have a lot of exposures to either polyaromatic means or to a lot of endocrine disruptors, which we'll get to in a little while. But just think of the two is the good, 16, the bad, four, the ugly. So having said that, if we have a single nucleotide polymorphism in um, CYP1A1, uh, we have an upregulation of that pathway. And we know that the 2-hydroxy estrone metabolite has little estrogen receptor binding affinity, and it has actually been shown to decrease uh, cell pro proliferation by about 20 to 30% in cultured uh, breast cancer cell lines. So when you now have a SNP in CYP3A4, you have increased production of the 16-hydroxy estrone, which is not so good, right? I called it the bad. And historically, we know that the 2 to 16 ratio um, has had um, some difficulties as, as of late. But let's just first look at what it's about. So when you have elevated 16-hydroxyestrone or an upregulated CYP3A4, we know that the 16-hydroxyestrone has a strong estrogenic activity, can turn on the estrogen receptor, and it has you have a greater likelihood of estrogen-dependent um, conditions, like adenomyosis, for example endometriosis. But we also know that the 16-hydroxy metabolite is um, a potent estrogenic molecule and that it can activate the estrogen receptor and can induce proliferation of cultured breast cancer cells by up to 40%. Now, the problem is that lately, we haven't had as good sort of clinical outcomes when just looking at the 2 to 16 ratio, although historically has received a lot of attention. And um, Dr. Rogan has spent pretty much her entire life uh, researching this. Um, the, I think one of the um, problems here, though, that we need to consider is that where we have women with uh, breast cancer and, and you see that they have, it, if they have an increase in the 16-hydroxylation pathway, um, when we sort of change the 2 to 16 ratio, we haven't necessarily seen a change in clinical outcomes. But I would urge you to consider the fact that maybe this is because we've focused on the 2 to 16 and the 2 to 16 ratio is looking at phase 1. And I said earlier that when you upregulate a phase one um, or when a estrogen goes through phase one, you have a more reactive intermediate and then you need to have phase two support in order for it to be um, either further metabolized or extra for it to be protective when we're talking about the two pathway. So I think the problem is maybe we haven't focused enough on phase two detoxification and we're just looking at the two to 16 ratio and we really need to be looking at what's going on with methylation and glutathione conjugation. And we'll get a little bit more into that in a little while. Because historically, we know that the 2 to 16 um, ratio has been um, increasing with uh, women with breast cancer at all ages and also on postmenopausal post -menopausal women who then went on later to, de to um, develop breast cancer had a higher 2 to 16 ratio than control, as well as also uh, when you're looking at breast cancer stage, that women with lower ratios had a poor prognosis. So again, I think it's a, we've focused on the 2 to 16 ratio, but we really should have been focusing maybe a little more on phase two, in, in my opinion. Now, what if we have an upregulated or a single nucleotide polymorphism in CYP1B1? Well, then we have an increase in the 4-hydroxy pathway, or what I call the ugly, which can then form Pro, not only it's not only procarcinogenic, but it can then form the three to four quinones if it is not methylated. So again, a single nucleotide polymorphism 
phase one, it means an upregulation. If you're talking about CYP1B1, it's going to need lead to increased 4-hydroxy um, estrone. And we know that um, when you're talking about breast cancer, for example, that if you have an increase in CYP1B1 and you have more of the 4-hydroxy estrone, that can then become a converted or can go down the pathway to the 3-4 quinones, which can react with your DNA to form specific um, depurinating adducts. And we know that these initiated cells can then be promoted by a number of processes, including not just hormone receptor stimulated proliferation, um, but that these can then be sort of our, that they lay our groundwork for assessing and preventing disease. Now I want to repeat that again because I'm quoting this from this article. And it says, these results lay the groundwork for assessing risk and preventing disease. So in other words, we can use the estrogen metabolites to really look at risk and prevent it in our patients. And this is a study from 2006, but I mentioned earlier one from 2001, and we have others more recent than that from 2006 all the way to 2017. So there's lots and lots and lots of literature support for this. Now, if you have a polymorphism again in CYP1B1, you have faster enzyme activity, so you have more production of the 4-hydroxy estrones, a tendency for lower 2 to 16, but again, an increased risk of breast cancer. Now, in particular, though, remember how I said the 2 is the healthier pathway? So if you have a SNP in CYP1A1, um, then that is protective, but it's only protective if it's then methylated. But there's an exception. If you have both, so if you have a SNP in CYP1B1, so you're using the 4 pathway, and you also have a SNP in CYP1A1 or the 2 pathway, and you have a lot of xenobiotic exposure, that actually can increase your risk. It's sort of synergistic for um, breast cancer and hormone-related cancers. So when it comes to the CYP1B1 and you have the 4 hydroxy estrone or for hydroxylase activity, we know that that's present in a lot of tissues, not just in the liver, such as breast, ovary, and prostate, and that that's what can then give rise to hormone-sensitive cancer. So we need to be looking at this, not just in terms of exposure in our women, but particularly in our men too, with respect to prostate cancer. I think that's really important. We should be doing estrogen metabolism on men as well as on women. Now, the 4-hydroxyestrone is very potent, but remember that it's particularly potent if it's not inactivated by catecholamine methyltransferase, because then it can go down to the quinone pathway. So it can be oxidized to quinone compounds, which then lead to DNA attic formation in breasts, prostate, for example. And we also see this in other conditions, such as endometriosis and uterine fibroids, and, uh, of course, prostate cancer, as I already mentioned. Now, it's important to also realize that when we're using conjugated equine estrogens, which I know that none of you are using, and just like you're not using any oral estrogens, but one of the things we need to consider is that for some of the patients that are still using the conjugated equine estrogens, that those are preferentially hydro hydroxylated through the 4-hydroxy pathway. So extremely important to remember that. And that even if someone does not have a SNP, so a person who has no SNP, no single nucleotide polymorphism in, let's say, the CYP1B1, which would force them to be on the 4-hydroxy pathway, but they have a lot of environmental exposures to endocrine disruptors, xenobiotics, your bisphenol A, your polybrobinated diphenyl ethers, your all the perfluorinated um, chemicals, which unfortunately all of us have been exposed to, that then you are preferentially using the 4-hydroxy uh, pathway. So even if you don't have the polymorphism, but you have a lot of these endocrine disruptors or xenobiotic exposure, you are going to produce a higher 4-hydroxy um, estrone and even the 16-hydroxy estrone. So extremely important that these can actually modify the CYP enzyme family. All the more reasons why we really need to focus on, you know, how do we help our patients detoxify. Now, bisphenol A um, has had quite a bit of attention lately. And one, because some of the earlier literature talked about the fact that it had a weak estrogenic property. And so therefore, it was a weak carcinogen and it didn't do much harm. 
Well, the problem is that it doesn't just do harm by its estrogenic um, effects, but what I just mentioned, but the fact that it the it preferentially uses the 4-hydroxy pathway so that the catechol of bisphenol A can actually alter expression of estrogen activating and deactivating enzymes. And then it can also compete with the methylation uh, by catechol or methyltransferase. And so you actually get an unbalanced metabolism of estrogens and you increase the formation of quinones, and, which then can form DNA addicts and lead to cancer initiation. So it's really important that we look at exposure to bisphenol A and the fact that it can increase your risk of developing cancer. And it's not necessarily by its, its direct estrogenic effect. Now, what are xenoestrogens? Let's just take a step back and look. Because um, these are chemicals, now they can be formed from a variety of both natural as well as anthropogenic sources, and they can interfere with end endogenous estrogens they can either by mimicking them, but they can also block their responses, either be a non-genomic or genomic signal. So it's really, uh, they do quite a bit of harm, unfortunately. And so they can disrupt normal signaling pathways and then lead to malfunctions in many, many different types of, of tissues in our bodies. Now, this particular study was really important to me because it again looked at how earlier studies talking about many of these xenoestrogens, particularly bisphenol A, for example, um, that they're originally thought to be weak, sort of in terms of their estrogenic effect, are actually more potent uh, because they go through these non-genomic signaling pathways that then contributes to their ability to disrupt endocrine function. So extremely important that we learn that and realize how important that is in assessing your patient's risk. So xenoestrogens really are uh, been called imperfect potent estrogens and endocrine disruptors because you have to look at the fact that the more efficacious a xenoestrogen is, the more it disrupts the actions of physiologic estrogens. So it can more potent it is, the more disruption it causes, and it's not just via its estrogen receptor function. But xenoestrogens can also alter the estrogen receptor, particularly estrogen receptor alpha. And so it's another target that it can um, cause havoc, so to speak, because um, it can mimic estrogen, even in the absence of the hormone. Now, this I want you to really, really understand because I see um, a lot of my colleagues and some you know, very, very astute and um, smart colleagues of mine um, sort of forgetting to include this, sort of connect the dots, so to speak. Uh, because let's say you have a patient that presents to you and uh, a woman, in this case, with a body very significant for estrogen dominance. So sort of the uh, pear, the extreme pear-shaped woman. And let's say we measure the estrogen levels. And you may even measure all three estrogens, so estradiol, estriol, and estrone. And um, they're not high. Let's say they're normal or they may even be low for whatever stage they're at, you know, whether it's menopause or perimenopause. And although they, the extreme pair means estrogen dominance, they'll consider that they don't have estrogen dominance based on the laboratory results. But realize that I just said that these xenoestrogens can mimic estrogen even in the absence of the hormone. So if you have someone that presents to you and it's an extreme pair, so it has an estrogen dominant body, even if they have normal or low estrogen levels, that patient is estrogen dominant, but it's most likely estrogen dominant due to the xenoestrogens. So remember to keep that in mind because they can mimic estrogen even in the absence of the hormone. And of course I had to put in a slide about insulin resistance and how important that is because that's sort of my thing. So just many different ways that xenoestrogens can cause insulin resistance. They can cause by you know, direct a toxic effect on the pancreatic beta cell. Um, and in here they're particularly talking as bisphenol A, uh, but also by stimulating the estrogen receptor alpha, A can produce an excessive um, insulin signaling. So many different, um, ways that can lead to insulin resistance or uh, changes in estrogen metabolism that then contribute to um, the, our risk for breast cancer or hormone-related cancers. Now, there's, what can we do about all this? Well, we know that there's things that can help modulate 
both phase one and phase two. Here are some examples of those that can modulate CYP1A1 or 1A2, as well as CYP1B1. But although that's important and we want to use those, um, and of course we want to start with diet and nutrition and lifestyle, and I'll get to that under treatment in just a little while, but I just wanted to uh, focus on how important phase two is, and that, that's where I believe we should be starting that we really should be starting by supporting phase two, particularly meth methylation and glutathione conjugation before we actually do anything to phase one. So let's just focus a little bit on phase two. And again, remember two major pathways. Phase two is a conjugation pathway where you have sulfation, glucuronidation, acetylation, methylation, amino acid conjugation, and glutathione conjugation. So the important thing to remember here too is that for phase two we really need to make sure the patients have sufficient amino acids available so that their digestion is working properly or that we're supplying amino acids until we fix the underlying dysfunctions that could be um, causing them to maybe not properly digest their proteins into amino acids now let's just look at what happens in phase two. So phase two, we're predominantly talking about catechol or methyltransferase when we're discussing estrogen metabolism as well as glutathione conjugation. So COMT or catechol or methyltransferase is what's going to um, help us methylate. And we can also have, uh, or we want to also support glutathione conjugation because you sort of have a competition going on between 4-hydroxyestrone going down to be methylated by COMT versus going down the 3,4 quinone pathway, which could also be neutralized by glutathione. But in any case, we want to try and avoid it going down that pathway and have proper methylation going on as well as glutathione conjugation. So remember that 2-hydroxyestrone is only protective against cancer when it's methylated by COMT. And I, I believe that this may be one of the reasons why if we're just working on the two to 16 ratio, we may not see big changes in clinical outcomes because we really haven't been focusing on phase two or the methylation and glutathione conjugation. And of course, if there's proper methylation with COMT, then 4-hydroxyestrone is much less likely to oxidize to carcinogenic compounds. And we can also use the um, two um, and the four um, ratios to provide a, an idea of what's going on with the methylation capacity in, in a given patient. And so what does COMT do? Well, it catalyzes the shift of methyl group from the coenzyme um, acetinacylmethionine or SAMI to one hydroxyl group of the catechols. But remember that in order for that to happen, uh, we need some cofactors and particularly magnesium. So magnesium is extremely important. It's also one of my favorite minerals. And remember that in phase one, I said, if you have a single nucleotide polymorphism, you have an upregulation of that pathway. Right In phase two, you actually have a down regulation. So polymorphism is associated with reduced enzyme activity, which to me sort of goes against what we would want to happen. And so if you have a COMT SNP, uh, whether it is heterozygous or homozygous, you can have less production of the two uh, methoxyestrogens, and so less neutralization to the pro-carcinogenic or hydroxyestrogens. And you have also, also have, in those patients, impaired clearance of catecholamine. So those are the patients that once they're nervous or they're anxious, they have a very difficult time calming down. You know, it's not all in their head. It could be a single nucleotide polymorphism. And these, those are the patients that also tend to have an increased sensitivity to pain. Or if you have a patient you know, with increased sensitivity to pain, consider that they may have a COMT SNP. We also know that there's increasing breast cancer risk with decreasing COMT um, activity, and risk is higher, especially in those patients with low folate or high homocysteine, or if they have a coexisting polymorphism in glutathione as transferase. So extremely important to look at that. Now, with respect to COMT, we've had several studies showing that individuals with low activity of COMT, so a SNP decreasing the activity, um, they have a greater risk for breast cancer. But we also have studies showing that that can happen with other uh, problems in the uterus, such as adenomyosis, as well as um, endometriosis, and also uterine fibroids. And think about estrogen metabolism. You know, I've, been, I've mentioned um, estrogen, uh, I'm sorry, I've mentioned breast estrogen metabolism with respect to 
prostate cancer and breast cancer quite a bit, but think of other cancers, the so most hormone related cancers. This is a, a study on looking at estrogen metabolism and ovarian cancer. So we know that in this case, it's also an imbalanced um, estrogen metabolism where you have more formation of the DNA addicts that can really play a critical role. So I, one thing took me a long time to sort of wrap my head around and try to figure out is, okay, I can understand COMT. I can understand that a single nucleotide polymorphism means less activity. Um, but where does MTHFR fit in? And should I be checking that SNP on everyone? So really what, what I think of it, or the way that it's helped me figure it out is, think of MTHFR sort of one of the ways that you provide methyl groups to COMT. And so that it's important that we look at MTHFR as well as COMT if you're doing um, genomic analysis, for example, and that MTHFR or, or polymorphisms in MTHFR have been associated with uh, breast cancer risk as well. And I often get asked, so when we're looking at estrogen metabolites and we're looking in the urine, because it's the only way that we can look at the four pathway, you know, in serum, you can look at the two hydroxy uh, to two to six, uh, two hydroxy to 16 hydroxy ratio. But in order to get the methylation step and to get the four, which I feel is extremely important, you need to be doing it in the urine. And yes, the answer is yes, they are representative. This is study on the two to 16 ratio. And we also have studies looking at the four um, and the methoxy steps in the urine. Now, I think it's extremely um, important that we look at what are the studies that we have at our disposal and just how much literature support we really have for this, particularly for looking at the estrogen metabolism. So this is a study from 2014 that talks about aberrant DNA methylation in serum, plasma, or vaginal fluid will enable early identification of individuals before cancer becomes symptomatic and poses serious risk to well-being and monitoring and for the personalization of cancer treatment. Why are we not putting this into clinical practice is my question. And of course, that doesn't apply to anybody in the audience because I know you are all doing it. It's more of all, all of our other colleagues. And so we want to look at the two, the 16, the four, as well as the two methoxy and the four methoxy. And of course, you can also look um, at the ratios because it's really important that we realize that it's these depurinating adducts that migrate from cells that can be found in these body fluids that are biomarkers of cancer risk. Here's a study from 2006 talking about this. And it goes on to mention that this uniform, unifying mechanism of the origin of cancer and other diseases suggests that preventive strategies based on the level of depurinating DNA adducts that generate the first critical step in the initiation of diseases. So extremely important that we look at it and we have the literature to support it. Now, so we're putting all this together, looking at phase one and phase two. Uh, remember that when we're looking at phase two, it's COMT and also glutathione conjugation. So the way I always look at this, uh, which kind of helps me figure things out and kind of put things into perspective, is I call this the double whammy, the triple whammy, or the quadruple whammy. And that is, if you have a SNP, in CYP1B1, and you also have a SNP in COMT, but no SNP in any of the other areas. Um, to me, that's your double whammy. But if so, because you have an upregulated CYP1B1 and you have sort of a downregulated calico or methotransferase, so you're not able to methylate it, but you still may be able to glutathione conjugate it. But what if you have a SNP in CYP1B1? a SNP in COMT. So you have an upregulated CYP1B1, downregulated COMT, and you have a glutathione SNP. Those are called my triple whammies. Um, and, and particularly in women with prior history of breast cancer, you see that a lot when you do the genomic analysis. And my quadruple whammies are those that have an upregulated CYP1B1, also a SNP in CYP1A1, have a lot of exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals or xenoestrogens, and they have a downregulated COMT, so a SNP in COMT, homozygous or heterozygous, as well as a SNP in glutathione. And when you do this clinically, then you can see, you know, just how much patients are at risk. And many times they come to you after they've already had cancer, but in that case, you still want to prevent a second cancer because that's what they're most at risk for. Now, um, this is a study actually looking at the um, 
for hydroxy pathway and looking at COMT, but also really talking about how important glutathione is. So you want to make sure that you're catalyzing your um, four hydroxy estrone to the methoxy uh, through COMT, but that we're also looking at glutathione conjugates. And because they even go on to say, if however these two processes are insufficient, the 3,4 quinones can react with DNA addicts to form or react rather react with DNA to form depurinating um, DNA addicts. So extremely important that we look at both steps. And you can do estrogen metabolism and also do your genomics. Uh, both in phase one as well as in phase two. And phase two, don't forget, we want to look at COMT as well as glutathione. Although, you know, if you do the genomics profile, and this is the one from Genova, for example, then you, you can look at all the different SNPs um, that you have at our disposal. So again, just a little bit of a review. SNP in phase one means upregulation in that pathway. SNP in phase two means a downregulation of that pathway which is sort of counterintuitive. It's counter to what you would want to have in a patient anyway. Now, let's look at, well, so what can we do? How can we approach our patients? How can we help our patients decrease the risk? Uh, as well as our patients and ourselves, not forgetting ourselves as well. Well, I think that um, this study really sort of brought it home to me in terms of what exactly can be done because this is not just talking about anyone this is talking about postmenopausal breast cancer risk associated with hormone therapy so even women who are on hormone therapy that their risk can be modified by genetically determined variations in phase one and phase two enzymes involved in steroid hormone metabolism so in other words if we're looking at their with their variations in phase one and phase two we can then change their risk. And how do we go about that? What exactly do we do? So to me, my most important thing is to really be able to properly assess someone's risk. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, even if someone may have normal levels of estrogen, they may have abnormal levels of these xenoestrogens that sort of force them in a sense to metabolize their estrogens through the 4-hydroxy pathway or they upregulate those pathways. So it's not just about our endogenous hormones or even a bioidentical hormone you may be giving someone, it's also about their prior exposures or their ongoing exposures or their total body load. So we really need to connect the dots in their history and what you find on physical exam to try and do your proper assessment. And then of course, we're gonna try and decrease exposure and promote detoxification, as well as enhancing elimination too, um, because as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you create more intermediates through phase one, for example, but you're not helping phase two, and you're not helping eliminate them, then those are, you're creating more free radicals or actually sort of wreaking more habits, so to speak. And then we want to really make our patients aware and educate them about how important this is and how much we really have at our disposal. Because we have studies showing that, for example, for breast cancer uh, prevention, if we modify the estrogen metabolism profiles through lifestyle or chemo preventive strategies, we can decrease cancers. We can do cancer prevention by looking at estrogen metabolism profiles and sort of optimizing them through lifestyle and chemopreventive strategies. This, to me, this is amazing that we actually have this and it's just not being applied. So as with everything, I also sort of de developed my own protocol. And I mentioned already that it's all about decreasing exposures, but also starting with found food as our foundation. So nutritional support with wholesome food, fresh, whole, colorful, and processed, high in fiber with nuts and seeds. So you're increasing some omega-3s, using herbs, spices, as well as fermented food products, soluble fiber, and low glycemic load. You want to use both soluble and insoluble fiber, but you get a lot of insoluble fiber through many of, of our um, vegetables, and I also like adding some soluble fiber as well. We want to work on decreasing insulin stimulation because we know that those type of diets are also sort of your cancer pre preventing um, diets. And then I do an elimination diet on all my patients just to see what type of foods they may be sensitive to. And you can do it 21, 21 day, you can do it longer. There's one at the um, IFM website that you can use. And then we're going to use targeted supplementation, starting with our food, but then adding supplements to help the, the metabolism of estrogen, but always starting with phase two first. 
that's what I like to do, helping methylation, glutathione conjugation, starting with food and then adding the supplements as needed based on your physical exam as well as your lab results. And then really talking to our patients about lifestyle modification, how important that is, particularly if they have a lot of stress in their life and how that in itself can um, also wreak havoc in their estrogen metabolism, how we want to really help our patients um, sort of de-stress better or handle stress better because we're constantly bombarded by stress. It's more of what do we do? How do we respond to it? And sort of what tools do we have at our disposal? We definitely want to talk about digestion as well as gut health and optimize gut health. And we all have the five hour program at our disposal, but also really focus on exercise and movement. And, you know, some people don't like to exercise, but in general, I can find some type of movement therapy that they like to do. Um, even if it's just, if they're the only able to sit in a chair, for example, and contract their muscles. That's movement. And we know that any movement is important. And with respect to cancer, particularly breast cancer in women, lymph movement is, is really important, and especially lymph movement around the breasts, because I believe that one of the reasons why women develop more cancers in the upper outer quadrant of the breasts is probably because that's when the area where we have less um, lymph movement. So it's extremely important that on a daily basis, or at least three or four times a week, that we're doing some kind of a lymphatic massage, particularly in the axilla area. And then we want to talk about sleep and how important that is, getting eight hours of sleep a night and quality sleep, you know, ruling out things like sleep and apnea, of course, and any other sleep problems. But also talking to our patients about this mind-body-spirit um, connection and really addressing, you know, do they have a spiritual practice? You know, how do they unwind? What do they do? Where do they go to for support? Do they have family support? Do they have community support? And you don't necessarily have to have family support from our biological families. You know, we can create sort of our own families of support. And then really looking at what are their exposures? Because we're constantly being bombard bombarded by xenoestrogens everywhere we go, practically. You know, I travel a lot and I have yet to, to be at an airport where they don't have those air fresheners now, but nowadays. They're constantly, you know, spraying those are xenoestrogens into the atmosphere. So thinking of things like air fresheners, deodorizers, fabric softeners, you know, some scented candles, as well as uh, perfumes, of course. And particularly our cosmetic and personal care products, you know, really looking at where are they coming from? Are they free of talc and chemical preservatives? And what's going on with, the, you know, even the packaging? And is the packaging in contact with the um, actual cosmetic that you're using? And also looking at what sort of ingredients do they have and what do we want to avoid? I mentioned that parfum is pretty much a meaning or synonymous with a phthalate, but this is a great list from the environmental working group that I like to use whenever I'm shopping um, for, you know, skincare product or makeup, because you want to look at so all, all the different ingredients that it has. And sometimes even though it may be um, organic, it may have some ingredients in there that you don't want that are undesirable, but also talking to our patients of, about other common personal care products, like, fabric detergents and dishwashing detergents and clothing softeners, whether you're using in the dryer or in the rinse cycle, you know, those can be xenoestrogens. And also, you know, even our own clothing, choosing more natural fibers whenever possible. And when we talk about cosmetic and personal care products, sometimes we, we have to go through the list. You know, we have to ask for patients, you know, do you use hair dyes, nail polish, hairsprays, gels, makeup, toners, cleaners, lotions, and creams. You know, we have to be really specific as well as what we ingest, you know, the food we put in our mouth and the drink that we drink. You know, we've all probably heard about the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. This is from the Environmental Working Group. The Clean 15 refers to those fruits and vegetables that are lower in pesticides and you probably can eat conventionally grown. Um, and like the Dirty Dozen, for example, which should be organic. And of course, we want to encourage our patients to eat organic when, whenever possible, but it's not always possible. And also, what else can we do? Well, as this study pointed out, for example, with breast cancer risk, we know that higher fish consumption is inversely associated with risk. And then we talk about, well, what type of, of fish? Well, we know that sardines, for example, have the best ratio of selenium to mercury. And they also have the advantage that they're small and they're young. You know, they don't live necessarily uh, long enough to bioaccumulate so that they're very high in omega-3s. And they're also high in selenium and low in mercury. Other things like salmon, for example, but then also looking at fiber, because we know that diets rich in, in fiber, particularly fiber from vegetables, is associated with small reduction in the risk of breast cancer, and that was independent of menopausal status. And then we have this study, which was a meta-analysis of 10 prospective studies, also looking at fiber 
and breast cancer. So lots that we can do in terms of diet. And then we're going to provide further methylation support. We know that when we eat lots of green leafy vegetables, and I always tell my patients eat 10 to 12 servings of vegetables and fruit, and usually only about two or three servings of fruit and make it low glycemic low fruit, that we're going to have more bioavailable folate. But we also want to make sure that we maybe we're supplementing, particularly if patients have single nucleotide polymorphisms. Not just magnesium, but B2, B6, B12, and folate. You know, folic acid is a synthetic form. What exists in nature is a folate, and we particularly want the 5-methylfolate, for example, if someone has a single nucleotide um, polymorphism in MTHFR. And then we want to give all the supplements that we can to opti optimize our glutathione. And you can take glutathione, but we can also take precursors, things like in acetylcysteine and lipoic acid. And then remember that things like vitamin C, magnesium, or vitamin E, or panathenic acid, as well as glycine and glutamine and all the B vitamins, you know, those are all help us increase our glutathione levels. And then you want as many antioxidants as you can, particularly from food, because we want to discourage the formation to those quinone compounds. And things like theanine and melatonin and, of course, sulforaphane. Extremely, extremely important to add to our patients' diet or to the sort of our armamentarium, as I call, against um, cancer or in order to try and decrease their cancer risk. Now, let's just take a quick look at two um, cases where you can apply this, and then uh, we'll go on to questions. So this first case is a 51-year-old menopausal woman uh, when she first presented to me, she was still menstruating, but she was having increasing hot flashes, night sweats, fatigue, and insomnia. On testing, she was found to be low on estrogen, low on progesterone, and also low thyroid, and she was stage one adrenal dysfunction. I should not say adrenal fatigue. I should, should really say adrenal dysfunction because now we know adrenal fatigue we really should only be referring to adrenal fatigue is if it's stage three it's adrenal dysfunction. So I started her on some hormone replacement, thyroid replacement, and adaptogens, as well as lifestyle modification because I really believe in looking at adrenals, thyroid, sex hormones, estrogen metabolism. That's my protocol. And um, she had good symptom control, but I told her if I'm going to put you on hormones, I, you have to agree to doing estrogen metabolism testing and maybe even um, genomic testing if, if we deem it necessary. And we have to be able to optimize it. And if I'm not, then we can all, I cannot use uh, or I cannot prescribe you bioidentical hormones. So she was feeling great. This is her first test on estrogen metabolism. And as you can see, if you just look at a 2 to 16 ratio, the 2 to 16 ratio looks good. It's a little higher than you like it, but it's good in general. And the 2 to 16, the 2 rate, the 2 hydroxy, pretty high. But now look at, if I was only looking at a 2, two to 16 ratio, and I didn't look at the 4 hydroxyestrone or the 4 methoxyestrone, look at what I'd be missing. Because her 4-hydroxyestrone was high, and her 2-methoxy was low. And this is a, a case I've had. This is a patient who's been a right patient for many years, and this is early on. So when we did this, I guess what I did to treat her? Well, I did what probably many um, have done, and which was now, which was looking back, was actually not the best thing to do, which is I put her on lots of cruciferous vegetables. That was good. I gave her some methylating factors but I also gave her I3C and DIM. I would not do that now, and let me show you why. So this is her follow-up. Her 2-hydroxyestrone went up, but so did the 16, and so did the 4-hydroxy. Four 4-hydroxyestrone four went way up, but the 2-methoxy did not. And this is something I find often, is that in retrospect, um, I would not have given her DIM, and I won't do that now. I would have given her more sort of um, methylation support, um, because that's basically what she needed. So in follow-up to this, uh, what I did was I really focused on her methylation factors as well as glutathione. So giving her more methylating factors, adding more to her food, making sure she's getting plenty of exercise, and you know addressing her um, stress and what's going on with her life and her, her levels of stress as well as you know what sort of environment does she live in and what is her support system, what's her mind-body-spirit equilibrium, and really focusing on phase two. And that's what I do now in all my patients, focusing on phase two before I do anything with phase one. So I won't add I3C and DIM until later, until I'm seeing that the methylation is adequate where I want it. 
Let's look at another case. This is a 55 year old postmenopausal with history of breast cancer. And her symptoms include fairly low energy, which has improved over the last few months. Some GI complaints, excuse me, some GI complaints, mostly constipation, occasional diarrhea, low thyroid function, and lots of stress. And she's taking already some um, supplements. And this is her first estrogen uh, metabolism test. So when you, you, what you can look at, you see that the 2-hydroxyestrone is 10.2, 2-methoxy, not exactly where we'd like it. Um, and then when you look at the 4-hydroxy, it's high, and the 4-methoxy is really low. Now let's look at the follow-up after we've given her some uh, methylating factors. So what happens since the first test is um, she did some methylation support with P5P, 5-methylfolate, methylcobalamin, trimethylglycine, turmeric, rosemary, uh, broccoli extract, and she was not on any prescription meds at the time. And then on follow-up labs, her labs are improved. I'll show that to you in just a moment. But she had a lot of improvement also in, in her energy. And of course, one thing I wanted to mention is when it comes to stress, it's always a slow process. And particularly in patients who already have a history of, um, can of a hormone-related cancer, and especially uh, breast cancer, it takes a long time, not just to sometimes to get their methylation perfect where you want it, but also to address stress as a factor sort of in their life and how they're able to adapt or change their lifestyle factors. Now, as you can see, a follow-up here, now her 4-hydroxy as well as her 4-methoxy is much, much, much improved. And even her 2-hydroxy um, is a less than 2, or her 2-methoxy is much better. So just another example of how we can really change your patient's risk by really looking at estrogen metabolism and doing the best that we can in order to improve their estrogen metabolism profiles. So I hope that this was um, useful for you and that I've convinced you of the importance of looking at estrogen metabolism in our patients, especially with respect to assessing their risk. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Great, thank you, Dr. Trindade. Uh, just a terrific presentation, and we've already received a lot of good feedback. I just want to remind everyone that the PowerPoint will be available on our website in PDF format next week. Uh, we did receive quite a few clinical questions, so I was going to start with this one question. Um, can a patient take too much methylation support, and your kind of thoughts around that? Yes, um, it's possible that we can sort of over-methylate now, it's more of a theoretical. I mean, I think we all worry about it. I haven't seen it too much clinically, uh, but one way that we can look at that is by following homocysteine. So particularly, uh, let's say that you have a patient that originally the homocysteine level was, maybe it was a little bit higher, it was nine or 10, and you've started um, adding the methylating factors, you know, food first, and then, you know, the um, nutraceuticals and now their homocysteine is four or three. Um, that's one way that we can gauge it because you really want a homo, you don't want a homocysteine that low. We usually want a homocysteine around six or so. Uh, six to seven is usually where I like my patients to be at. So that is one way that you can follow. In clinical practice though, it's something we all worry about and I always follow homocysteine you know, with initial labs and follow up. I have not seen it too much. And I've actually talked to several of my colleagues about this because we always sort of worry about it. And um, I think it's more of a worrisome when you're using a synthetic folate, like folic acid, for example, when we're using the methylated or the hydroxylated uh, bees, that has not um, seemed to be a problem. And I've talked to a couple oncologists about this as well. And that's what they feel like if we're using the activated um, folates, for example, or the activated uh, B12, whether it's methyl or hydroxy, um, it doesn't seem to be a problem. As we don't have, we have not seen it in the literature. Great. And another question: uh, If you have a patient who's on tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors, how do we interpret the uh, urine metabolite results for the estrogens? Well, the best thing that I can say is um, we basically interpret them based on what they're on because. Um, it, depending on what, how long they're going to be on. Now, it may be that someone is on tamoxifen and they're near the end and, and they're going to be changing. And so you may want to follow it after they've changed it. But usually what I do is I just assess it based on what they're on. 
um, because in many cases they're on a long term or at least they'll be on it for at least five years. So I just interpret it with whatever they're on and um, do as much as I can in terms of improving their methylation. Now there's one caveat that I want to mention and that is on patients on tamoxifen and some aromatase inhibitors but particularly tamoxifen, I think it's important that we do a genomic testing on them because it uh, is metabolized through the 2D6 pathway. And if they happen to have a single nucleotide polymorphism in that pathway, tamoxifen may not be as effective um, as you want it to be. And unfortunately, it hasn't been adopted into clinical practice across the board. Some oncologists will do the test and some won't. So it's important that with the patient that you're seeing that you also consider looking at the 2D6. Great. Um, another interesting question. If you have a patient who has high 4-hydroxy metabolites and lots of detoxification SNPs, what's your opinion on using bioidentical hormone therapy for uh, you know, protective against uh, bone health and, and cardiovascular risk? That's a great question and one that we all wrestle with. So um, I think when I first started on those, with, with those patients, when I first started practicing functional medicine, uh, I would say, no, let's get your estrogen profile perfect, and then um, we'll work on um, doing, doing your hormone, bioidentical hormone replacement. Now, I don't know if it's because I know a little bit more about the literature, or I just have more experience, or maybe I've gotten a little gutsier. Um, even if they're high for hydroxy, and that's their baseline, that's where they're at, I will start them on methylating factors, but I will also start them on bioidentical hormone replacement um, if they need it, if they're symptomatic or for whether, whether we're doing it for bone or for cardiovascular or even for uh, cognition, let's say. So um, because what we're going to do is we're going to follow them and we're going to see if by starting the bioidenticals, if we've actually changed that. Now, I use biased a lot um, because we know that the estriol is actually preventive uh, for in terms of looking at breast cancer and hormone-related cancers because it binds the estrogen receptor beta. So because I'm using mostly 80% estriol, 20% estradiol, that also helps me feel a little bit more comfortable. But on those patients, I'm, I'll start them on DHRT, but then I'll follow up you know, with their estrogen metabolism afterwards and make sure that I'm optimizing it. Great. And just one more question. Um, there are some uh, question marks around the, 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 a lot of the data that you presented and risk for breast cancer. Is that all breast cancers or just estrogen-dependent breast cancers? Actually, some of the studies um, show estrogen-dependent breast cancers where they were actually um, tested them, and others were not. So others were across the board. So the literature is mixed, and I probably could have done a better job of, of picking those out. Um, but that brings up a really important point. And that is anytime we read any study, it's important that we read through and figure out, you know, exactly what they did because sometimes the results that are in the conclusion um, or that sort of the media has taken from the study are not necessarily really what was discussed or even what was found in the study. So that's really important to look at that. We see that with um, the HRT, for example, where we'll have a study like the, especially the study that came out last year out of uh, Britain um, talking about how it um, BHRT actually they didn't say BHRT they said hormone replacement can increase breast cancer risk but then when you looked at the study they were using both bioidentical and also synthetic hormone replacement and so you can't make a conclusion across the board when you're looking at both uh, I mean they do all the time but it's important that we read through the study and really look at that so that's a really important point that some of the studies um, the estrogen or the breast cancer was estrogen receptor positive and some were not. And so sometimes we were the ones that need to sort of sift through the study and look at exactly what did they show and what did they do? That's a really important question. Really good question. Great. And thank you so much. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll end our question and answer period there. For additional educational materials, we'd like to encourage you to visit our website, www.gdx.net. On this site, you'll find sample reports, kit instructions, and other information for all of our profiles. 
Um, and after taking advantage of the materials found on our website, feel free to contact client services with your additional questions. You'll see a number on the slide for US and UK customer service. Additionally, please call client services if you need assistance in setting up a MyGDX account. We also offer complimentary appointments with our medical education specialist to answer questions related to our testing, including choosing the right test and reviewing patient test results. And finally, we'd like to encourage you to look for upcoming webinars on www.gdx.net. Next month, we'll have Dr. Rebecca Hunton presenting on GIFX in clinical practice, focusing on the gut. And thanks again, Dr. Trindade, for just a superb presentation. Oh, thank you, Michael, and thanks to everyone. And have a great day.